the, on the board are a list of, code, of sections from the probate code, which are quite important, and I ask you to please take a look at these. These probate codes are in your three-ring binder, and these are the most frequently tested sections of the probate code, so please be sure to take a look at those. Um, the um, the uh, probate code is organized into um, uh, basic parts: uh, forming a con forming a, a, a will, and if the will has been formed, then uh, the, uh, the determining how do you revoke a will form the will, revoke a will, and then there are problems if you have the will. So we'll begin with the formation of the will. Formation of the will is dealt with in sections around 6110. 6110, uh, you'll get out your code section, you'll see the, uh, it tells us uh, how to make a will. It tells us how to make a will, and it says the way you make a will is that you need a testator to, uh, if you're talking about a formal typed will, you need the testator to, uh, to type the will, someone to type the will, and then uh, you need the will executed, written and then executed. I'm talking about the formal will now. And in order for it to be executed, you need the uh, it takes three people. The testator needs to sign the will, and there need to be two witnesses watching the testator sign the will. The two witnesses have to be there at the same time watching this process take place. Now, of course, if the testator has already previously signed the will when the two witnesses arrive, the testator can say to the two witnesses, that's my signature. So the testator can either sign the will in front of the two witnesses or can acknowledge that that's my signature in front of the two witnesses. The, uh, and then the witnesses need to sign the will uh, and then it's effective. Now, the, the witnesses uh, do not have to sign the will. The code doesn't require for the wit that the witnesses sign the will in front of the testator because that really doesn't matter a lot. The testator isn't going to be there when the will is probated. But what does matter is uh, that uh, the process should be one continuous process as opposed to a uh, start and stop process. So you don't want to start the process and have the, uh, the testator sign and the two witnesses watch the testator sign and then a uh, uh, half hour later one of the witnesses signs and then uh, the, uh, uh, one of the witnesses goes out and goes to the restroom or something and comes back and then the other witness signs. Uh, it should be one continuous process. Uh, the sequence that I described to you didn't seem to create that much of a risk of fraud, but some sequences, if you break them up, they do create a risk of fraud. For example, if uh, the two witnesses watch the testator sign and then the two witnesses take us to the hospital cafeteria. And at the hospital cafeteria, one of the witnesses signs the paper, hands it to the other one. Then the other one puts it in uh, his uh, briefcase or purse and takes off to Hawaii with it and gets to Hawaii and remembers, oh, I'm supposed to sign it will. So they sign it and mail it back. So you now have the two witnesses' signature, but it wasn't conti one continuous transaction. And you can see how under those circumstances pages could be exchanged and various other funny things could happen. So it should be one continuous process if the process is broken up. There's not a code section that says it must be a continuous process. But the court, courts are watching for fraud and so you can see how breaking up the continuity creates the risk of fraud. So 6110 tells you how to execute a will and both parties need to be present and uh, uh, the two witnesses need to be there. They need to see the testator sign. They need to know that what the testator is signing is a will, is the testator's will. 
They don't need to know the contents of the will, but they need to know that that's the will and watch the testator sign it and then put their two signatures on it. Now, you can uh, see a good example of this if you take a look at the question from the July 96 bar, which is one of the questions assigned for today. If you look at that question dealing with the creation of a will, uh, it tells us that Tess was a widow with uh, two adult children and, um, uh, and the one same Sam and the other one same Donna. And line eight tells you that in 1992, Tess validly executed a typewritten will containing provisions A, B, and C. Or A and B, pardon me. Provision A, all my stock to my friend Fred. That is my big co stock to my friend Fred. My big co-stock, as you know, implies a specific gift rather than a general gift. And then item B, the residue of my estate to my daughter Donna. Well, you can see the problem here that uh, Sam isn't getting anything. Sam's her son. She can do that. She can leave him out of the will completely if she wants to, and she just did that. Uh, but the line 15 says, during the next two years, Seth and Sam reconciled. And so she now decides to put him into the will. So in 1995, Tess prepared another typewritten will, that document that says, uh, one, I revoke all prior wills. Well, that's enough to revoke. Saying I revoke all prior wills, if you take a look at 6120, you'll see that that's enough. Uh, Let's look at that while we have it because getting familiar with what these code sections actually say is important. And if you look at 6120, 6120 says a will or any part thereof is revoked by any of the following. Section A, a subsequent will which revokes the prior will or part expressly or by inconsistency. And that's exactly what we have here. And then 6120B says you can tear it up and burn it and all that sort of stuff for the intent to revoke. So here on this problem from July 96 at line 18, where it says, I hereby revoke all prior wills, that would be effective to revoke the 1995 will uh, because 6120A says you can revoke by putting that in a prior will. Now, be careful, if you put that in a letter, that doesn't revoke the will. The thing you, to revoke another will, and by doing it in writing, the document which revokes the prior will must itself qualify as a testamentary document. Now, remember that in order for a document to qualify as a testamentary document, uh, that it does not have to dispose of property. It can dispose, it, it is, uh, qualifies as a testamentary document if it uh, uh, either disposes of property or names a new executor or, or names an executor or revokes prior wills. Either one of those three things, revoking prior wills, naming an executor or disposing of property, the will needs to do one of those three things, but it doesn't have to do all three of them. And so uh, the, and so a, a document which revokes prior will must itself qualify as a will. Uh, so line 18, that revocation works. Line 20, B, my big co stock to my son Sam. Aha. So he originally gave the big co stock to Fred, now he's giving it to Sam. Uh, and so uh, the uh, line uh, 22, the residue of my estate to my daughter Donna. Okay? So that looks like a perfectly good provisions. Let's see what the execution of this will looks like. Line 24. Tess took this will to the house of Witt, a neighbor. Declare to Witt that that was her will. Okay, that's good because now neighbor knows that this is a will. In order for neighbor to be a witness, you got to know that the thing you're witnessing is a will. So he, he told her that this was her will and signed the will in Witt's presence. So that's good, except that you've got to have two people present. And if you read uh, 6110, you, you, need, uh, you need these requirements that a person has to uh, two witnesses present at the same time, 
know know that this is that the person is signing a will, and they got to watch them either sign it or acknowledge the signature. And so here we have one person, namely Wit, is present, and only Wit is present. And so the requirement of 6110 that you have two people present at the same time, this is the one that says you need two people here. And um, we don't meet that requirement. Continuing at line 25, with then signed the will as a witness. Well, that's good. Although she did not know its content. Well, the witnesses do not need to know the content. They just need to know that the document is a will. Line uh, 28. Seth next took the will to the house of Neff, another neighbor, and asked Neff to witness this paper. Well, two problems here. One is that Neff didn't know that the paper was a will, and the other is that uh, the two witnesses were not there together watching uh, Seth either sign or acknowledge the signature. And so line 29, Neff signed the will as witness, although he did not understand that it, is, it was a will. So neither Witt nor Neff uh, did everything they were supposed to do. They weren't together, plus some of the other information is missing. So what that tells us is that this second document, the one written in 1995, is not a valid will. It's not a valid will because it was not executed with a proper uh, formality. And so it's not a will, and since the 1995 document is not a will, then line 18 has no effect. Line 18 says, I hereby revoke all prior wills, but you can't revoke prior wills unless the document you're doing it with is itself a will. And you can revoke prior wills again by tearing, burning, obliterating, and that sort of stuff with the intent to revoke, and that's at 6120B. 6120A, you revoke by a written instrument. 6120B, you revoke by a physical act. And so, uh, the, the 1992 will is still very much in effect. It was not revoked by this 1995 document. Continuing now at line 31. Uh, after Tess's death, both wills were found in her safe deposit box. Okay, except that we know that that 1995 document is not a will. Uh, continuing line 31. The 1992 will had a large X drawn across all of its pages. Oh, well, large X drawn across all the pages. The, we are now looking at, uh, you can revoke, and you can revoke by, put the notes here, you can, so you can revoke, and you can revoke at A, section A, by another will, and section B, by a physical act, revoked by a subsequent will, revoked by a, a, a physical act. Let's see what the physical act that are, will work. And 6120 uh, says, 6120B, so the will can be revoked by burning, by being burned, torn, canceled, obliterated, uh, destroyed, with the intent and for the purpose of revoking it by either the testator herself or by another person in the presence of the testator and by the testator's direction. Well, uh, the large X that we see drawn through the 1992 will uh, is, uh, what is that? Let's see, the code says burned. Well, the large X isn't burned. Canceled, obliterated, destroyed, canceled. People put big X's on things and they use it mean canceled. That's customary. And so this 1992 will was uh, revoked by cancellation right here. It was revoked by cancellation because it was uh, uh, canceled uh, with the intent. Uh, it, was, it was canceled it says it, um, by the testator or by another person in the testator's presence and by the testator's direction. Well, we don't know that the X was done by the testator, but the will was found in the testator's safe deposit box. And there's a presumption that it was found in a, in a safe place, that everything that's written on the will was uh, something that the testator did. If someone claims that somebody else 
put the big X across there, they've got the burden of proof. And so here, the document was found in the place where it normally would be kept in the safe deposit box with the presumption that the writings on there were the testator's writings. Therefore, the big X is presumed to be cancellation by the testator. And therefore, the 1992 will is revoked. Now, the 92 will is revoked. Uh, the problem now is, you see the problem. The 1992 will has been revoked, and the 1990, uh, so the, uh, so the, you see the problem, the 1992 will is revoked. And the 1995 document is not a will. And so, therefore, uh, test is in, the test data is not in testing. They're in testing meaning that they don't have a will. Well, if the testator is now in testate and does not have a will, then how will the property will go? The property will go in testate, will go, uh, the property will go one half to Donna and one half to Sam, because those are her children. Uh, this is how it will go in testate. Uh, and uh, this is pretty close to what she wanted, obviously, because uh, in the, uh, let's uh, continue to read, the 932, the 1995 will was unmarred, line 34, Tess is survived by Donna, Sam, and Fred, and her net estate uh, of, consisted of her big coast stock, worth 400000 and cash worth 600000 Okay, and so the, the, uh, the, the, um, if you go by the, if it goes in test state, it'll go half and half, 500000 each, and if it goes by the, uh, and that's uh, probably what she would like, but would you like to revive, we could try to use DRR to revive the 1992 will. In other words, the 1992 will, the 1992 will was revoked in the belief that the 1995 will was valid. But it wasn't. And when you revoke something in the belief that the new disposition is valid and it's not, you can revive the revoked will if you can revive the revoked will if doing so would more nearly carry out the testator's intent than letting the property go in, uh, in testate. Here, if you revive the 1992 will, which you can do by DRR, if you revive the 92 will, then Sam won't get anything, and Fred will get the big coast off. And you know, based on her last will, she was trying to give Sam something and leave Fred out. And so, if you revived the 92 will by DRR, it would, it would uh, uh, defeat the last known intent of the testator. Therefore, you would discuss DRR, but you would not use it. Now, uh, the, uh, so we understand 6110, we were looking at some of these code sections. 6110 tells you how to revoke the will. 6111 tells you about a holographic will. And you do need to know about holographic wills. And you need to read the whole thing because 6110 has some subtle points in there about what do you do when there's no date on the holographic will and that sort of thing. And if you, uh, so please don't just take this in general. Please take a look at what it says. So 6111 and then uh, 6112 is the, um, uh, uh, 6112 is the, the, when you have the extra witness, this is the interested witness, so 
the 6112 is the interested witness case. What is the interested witness case about? Well, the interested witness case says that if you, if a person uh, signs a will and uh, they are one of the one of the beneficiaries in the will, the person signs the will and they are one of the beneficiaries in the will, then there's a presumption that the person who signed it was uh, committed fraud undue influence, menace, the rest, that sort of thing. Uh, and so if someone gives a million, write the will, and they give you a million dollars in the will, and you sign as one of the witnesses, there's a presumption against you. And the presumption is that you got that, you committed fraud, menace, undue influence, that sort of thing. And so uh, the uh, normally, if you procured your interest by fraud, then uh, you get nothing. But here, the situation is that there's a mere presumption that the person, the interested witness, the 6112 interested witness, there's a mere presumption that this person committed fraud. So you give them the opportunity to rebut the presumption if they can. So it's a rebuttable presumption. They try to rebut the presumption that they committed fraud, menace, undue influence. And then if they cannot rebut the presumption, what happens to them? And the answer is, if they cannot rebut the presumption, they get the lesser of what they would have gotten from the previous will, if there was one, in test eight, if there was no previous will. They get the lesser of what they would have gotten from the previous will or this will, whichever is smaller. Again, if the interested witness cannot rebut the presumption, then they get the smaller of the previous will or this will. And if there was no previous will, then they get the smaller of intestate or this will. Now, uh, so uh, that's 6112, and then finally uh, 6113. 6113 is the section that deals with when the, the will is executed in a state, normally people are in California, they execute the will in California, you don't have the problem. But if you have a California resident that goes to Nevada and executes a will, or a um, California uh, has a resident that uh, uh, writes the will here and then moves to Nevada, or they, uh, they, they California resident writes the will in Nevada and then dies in Nevada, or they come back here and die. And those options are all discussed here at 6113, so that's why that's important. That is tested from time to time, so be sure to read that. So this is done. Uh, then uh, the um, 6120 is the revocation. 6121. Uh, 6121 is the code section that says that duplicate original says duplicate wills. It says uh, if uh, you write a will and you simply uh, uh, make copies of the will and you write the will and the person signs it, then you make a bunch of copies. Well, those are just copies, and that's just evidence of what the will says. But if you make the will, and then the person signs several of them separately, then these are considered duplicate originals. These, and these duplicates are probatable because each one was signed separately. And the, but now, if you revoke one of those, you don't want to have to go around and gather up all the duplicate originals in order to revoke a will. So this rule says that if you revoke one of the duplicate originals, that revokes them all. That's 6111. Uh, 61, uh, 22 and 23. Uh, the 61, uh, 22, 6122 is simply the code section that says if you uh, if you write a will and if you're, if you're married and you have a will 
and then get divorced. That your spouse, that all the everything in the will that gives anything to your spouse, property or uh, uh, the power of appointment, that sort of thing, all that stuff is revoked by the divorce itself. It used to be that after you divorce someone, you then had to get your will changed, otherwise they stayed in your will. So this code section just takes them out of the will upon the divorce. And by the way, if you remarry the same person, uh, then the law also automatically puts them back in the will. 6123 is the uh, uh, is the one that's uh, it's important and it gets tested and it's a little tricky. Let me summarize it for you. In 5123, uh, here's the situation. A person uh, writes a will. And uh, they, write, they write a will and then uh, after writing the will, they, uh, they uh, decide, gee, uh, um, I'm going to write another will. So they write a will two. And will two revokes will one. And then they do a third thing. They decide to revoke will two. Does that revive will one? That's the question. Once again, person writes will one, then they write will two, which says I hereby revoke will one. And now the person revokes will two. They can revoke will two by any of the means of 6120, either the A or the B means of 6120, and they revoke the second will, does that revive the first will? That is the question. And the answer is 6123 says whether or not that revive the first will depends on whether the person intended to revive the first will or not. If they, uh, and you need some expression of that intent. And what 6123 says is that you can express that uh, the intent uh, can be, uh, your intent to revive will one can be because you said so contemporaneously with destroying will two. So while you were destroying will two, you think, now will one will be revived the way I want things. Okay, so a statement that is made contemporaneously, not before, but contemporaneously with revoking will two or subsequently can be made weeks, months, years later after revoking will two the person can say, uh, I revoked will two with the intent to revive will one. So, uh, was there intent to revive will one? That's what 6123 is about. Was there intent to revive will one? And you can prove it by subsequent statements. Also, the code goes on to say, you can show intent to revive will one by circumstances. And you can think of various circumstances, for example, leaving will one in the safe deposit box, but you can't find will two anymore. Well, that shows intent to revive will one. And so you can show intent, the test here at uh, 6123 is intent to revive. So. The test here is 6123, is intent to revive, and you can prove that intent in two ways. You can prove it by declarations, in other words, by statements, by statements, contemporaneous or subsequent, not previous, or by circumstances. Now, uh, the 6130 is the, uh, is the uh, dependent relative revocation. I'm sorry, this is incorporation by reference. And 6131 is acts of independent significance. Acts of independent significance. 
if you recall that uh, 6130 in cooperation by reference allows a person to write a will and they have the will and they want to incorporate some other existing document by referring to it and so you can incorporate another document by referring to it by simply identifying the document that you want to incorporate and by the way even if this is a holographic will you can incorporate handwritten material and vice versa so you can incorporate page 15 of the New York phone book if you want to and so but in order to do that you need to say in the will what you're incorporating so you need to identify the document that's being incorporated secondly the document which you are incorporating must be in existence at the time it must exist and um, so that's the second requirement the document must be in existence you have to identify it, it must be in existence uh, you have to intend to incorporate the reference the document and obviously that's important you have to intend to incorporate it and uh, finally uh, at the probate proceeding somebody's got to bring the document if you identify page 15 of the New York phone book then at the probate proceeding somebody's got to bring that page in and say this is page 15 of the New York phone book so those are the requirements to get something incorporated by reference and acts of independent significance are covered here and uh, these acts of independent significance are simply uh, the case where I can identify someone who uh, I want to get something out of the will. For example, the testator can say, everyone working at my factory on the day of death, give them uh, $20,000. Well, uh, that working at the factory is a way to identify the person who's going to get the money. And normally, in a will, you would put the person's name in there. Instead of putting the name in there, you have uh, identified either who the person is or what property they're going to get by some act that is independent of, of executing the will. People don't come to work at the factory in order to get something out of the will. Uh, if you say, every, all the jewelry in my safe to my daughter Mary, well, all the jewelry in my safe, you know, presumably put the jewelry in the safe in order for Mary to get it. It's in the safe for an independent reason. And so the, uh, whereas if you say uh, all the people named on my, uh, in the piece of paper on, on my night table, $10,000 each, well, why did you write the piece of paper on your night table? That piece of paper was apparently was written for the sole purpose of getting some money to those people. So that's not an act of independent significance, whereas working at the factory is an act of independent significance. Keeping the jewelry in the safe is an act of independent significance. And so you can use these acts of independent significance to actually identify who is going to uh, get property from the will or what they're going to get. That's what this one's about. Now, uh, since we're uh, working our way through these, let's uh, take a look at 6403. 6403 is the uh, uh, section that says... Uh, 6403 is the 120 hour rule and what it says is that uh, in the case of an intestate property only this is not the case of a will in the case of an intestate property the person who is going to receive the property intestate you need clear and convincing evidence that they survived the testator by 120 hours. And so if the testator and the person who is going to receive the property, I say testator, I'm sorry, if the decedent and the person who is going to get the property without a will, because it only applies to intestate property, okay, it does not apply to will. In the case of will, the person who is going to receive from the will uh, must survive the testator but not by 120 hours, it just has to survive. 
I mean, you need clear and convincing evidence that they survived, but not by 120 hours. In the case of intestate succession, they got to survive by 120 hours. And it says if they don't, then they don't get anything. Uh, the, uh, or if they don't survive for some other kind that you designate, they don't get anything. So that's what this one's about. And now comes these uh, cases here. Uh, this 61, 21, 610, this is the omitted spouse. This is the omitted child. These sections deal with the omitted spouse, and these with the omitted child. The omitted spouse section basically says if you were married and uh, you, um, and pardon me, if you're unmarried and you have a will, and then the person gets married and they don't change their will after getting married. Well, if you get married and don't change the will after getting married, then the new spouse is going to take the intestate share of what they would have gotten uh, intestate. Once again, the person's got a will, they get married, and then they die without changing the will. The surviving spouse will get an intestate share. But the surviving spouse will get that intestate share right here will get the intestate share unless there is a uh, provision in the earlier will that you wrote the, uh, before getting married. If the earlier will says, uh, if I get married, uh, I want my spouse to receive $3.25. Well, if you say uh, it, what you want uh, her, the surviving spouse to get in the previous will, or if you leave them out intentionally, in the previous will, or uh, if you leave them out intentionally, or say what you want them to get, then, they, then you go by that will. It's when the previous will said nothing about what to do about the spouse. Also, if you provide for the spouse in some alternative way, after getting married, the person didn't uh, rewrite the will, but they made some other provisions. They set up a trust for the surviving spouse. If you can show that that trust was set up in lieu of giving the spouse something, then that's what will happen. And the same thing in, uh, to the child. If you have a will and then a child is born after writing the will, well, if you change the will, that takes care of the child. It doesn't matter whether you include the child or not, but if you rewrite the will after the child was born, you can leave them out if you want to. You can leave out the spouse if you want to, if you rewrite a will after getting married. But you can't just get married and then forget to, to do anything about it at all. Because if you do, that's when these code sections come in. And the surviving spouse or the omitted child or the omitted spouse will get their intestate share unless the documents show that you intentionally omitted them uh, or that uh, you provided for them in some way outside the will. And in the case of the omitted child, we have one other provision because in the case of the omitted child, it's fairly common that if you've got young children, a parent will leave the, all of the money to the other surviving parent with the idea that this surviving parent will take care of the children. And you don't need, and the child who was born after the will was written, the child, to the people got married, and then uh, they had two children already, and they have a will. So you got two children in the will, and then a third child is born, but the will is not changed. And if one of the parties dies, and all the property goes to the surviving spouse, you expect the surviving spouse to take care of all three children, not just the two that were born, before, were born, uh, you know, and take care of all three children. And so if you made the new child, if you forced the new child to take an intestate share, because they were left out of the will, you can see how you got one child getting an intestate share and the other two children getting nothing, uh, and you don't want to do it that way. So, if the child 
So you, the, the couple is married, they got two children, uh, and they got a will, and then they have a third child and don't, right, don't revise the will, and one child dies. Well, if essentially all the property was left to the surviving parent, then the presumption is that child parents don't take care of all three children. So you do not, do not give that third child anything special in that case. But otherwise, a child born after the will was written will either get an intestate share uh, or uh, if the uh, money was, it will get an intestate share unless the, the third child was, was intentionally excluded and it's shown on the will, unless all the money was given to the other parent or almost all of it, or there are other circumstances where you can show that the, uh, the, the parent set up some uh, trust or did something else for this third child in lieu of the third child taking from the will. And take a look at that, read that, they get tested very often. This is omitted child and the omitted spouse, please look at those. Uh, so that's a review of the probate codes. Uh, the, I didn't put down 6113 for these out-of-state cases. And um, that pretty much uh, does it. The um, there are also six one twenty two. This is the one where if you get divorced, the divorce revokes. So right here. If you get a divorce, that revokes the will. You don't have to separately change it. It doesn't revoke the entire will. It revokes the will as to anything that was given to your former spouse. Okay, with those uh, code sections in mind, let's take a look at some more problems. Now, we uh, just successfully went through the problem uh, from July 96, they asked us in the July 96 problem, they asked us two things. Uh, line 37, is the 1995 will valid? And we know the answer to that, the 1995 will is not valid because it did not meet the, uh, the requirements of 6110. Secondly, they asked us at line 39, how should tests of the state be distributed assuming the 1995 will is not valid? And what they want you to point out there is that if the 1995 will is not valid, this will right here, if this will is not valid, uh, well, we still revoke the 92 will. We revoke the 92 will by putting the X to it, and that qualifies on the 6120B as a cancellation. And so the 92 will is void, it's been canceled. The 95 will never was a will, so the person is in testing. But now the question is, do you want to apply DRR to revive the 92 will? And the answer is, you apply DRR to revive the 92 will only, only, only if that does a better job of carrying out the test state of the last known intent than letting the property go in test state. If you revive the 92 will, Sam will be disinherited. That obviously was not her last known intent, and so let the property go in test state because this is what will happen if it goes in test state, and that's close to what she wanted anyway. So that's the February 1996 uh, problem, pardon me, the July 1996 problem. And uh, let's uh, do another problem. The uh, Let's look at the problem from February 2000. Uh, the February 2000 problem, let's do this. Rather than start a new problem right now, let's take a short break right now, and then let us uh, come back and do the problem from the February uh, 2000 bar exam. <laughs>